my father finally, in early 2005, finally called, and, and I write about this in the book in detail. He said, Shell, what have I done? Have, we're po- why are we not close like we used to be? And I realized I've got to come out to my dad because he thinks he's done something f- to make me pull away from him. So I rode uh, on my tour bus um, to a town where I had a show, which happened to be his hometown. And um, and all night long in my, in my bunk, I said to myself, you've got to come out. You're going to tell him. You are going to tell your dad tomorrow. Now, let me back up to when I was a kid. Um, my dad told gay jokes. Everyone in our town told gay jokes. I didn't know of another gay person in Wellsville, Kansas. My teachers told gay jokes. Mm. Um, it was part of the culture where I grew up. So I was terrified to tell my dad, but I also knew, you know, my dad had had a heart attack when he was 42 years old and uh, barely survived it, and I knew, you know, my dad's getting older. I don't want my dad to pass thinking that he did something wrong. I need to tell my father. So in my hotel room, uh, he walked in and said, Hey, kiddo, and I said, Dad, I need you to sit down. And I, of course, broke down and cried, and I said, I have to tell you something I've waited I've been afraid my whole life to tell you. And he said, are you okay? You're not okay. You're not okay. You have cancer. What's wrong? What's wrong? You don't have cancer. Are you okay? We'll be okay. What's wrong? And I said, um, I don't want to lose your love, but I'm, I'm gay. And we had a, about a two-hour talk. And he ran the emotions of, you know, that many parents who don't understand. He, the, his first reaction was okay and then he said but what about the guys you've dated and I said dad I tried to love them but I can't love them the way that they loved me and I explained to him how hard it was for me to hide and how much of a rock bottom uh, I had hit and um, at the end of the conversation I said dad do you do you love me even though and he grabbed me square by my shoulders and he said kid I don't love you because even though I love you because And this has started a growth and a new relationship between my father and I. My dad has an eighth grade education. He's a Navy war vet, and he's a concrete worker. And you have never seen a human grow so much as you've seen Stan Elright grow. He's joining PFLAG. He is the biggest advocate, and the thing that changed for him, and, you know, he was on the Oprah Winfrey show with with me, and as Oprah said to it, she said, Stan, what changed? What, what changed from your thinking that a gay person was a building block of sin and evil doing and perversion till now? Till now that when your daughter came out to you, you said, okay. He looked at Oprah and he said, Oprah, I know her. And that's the thing. That's why I came out because I know a lot of fans know my name. A lot of people by all measure think I'm a great gal. They think I'm a great American a sweet person that's always been nice to them. And I thought that it was no longer, uh, it even became criminal for me to hold my truth back because I can in some way facilitate ease and understanding and maybe help that 14-year-old kid have a talk with his parents. We're reaching uh, many millions of people all around the world in many different countries around the world who deal with sexuality in all different ways uh, and culturally, religiously, it's a dream of mine, you know, that one day we don't have to have labels, that we can all be the same regardless of our choices and preferences. Yeah. And we don't need to be labeled. Yeah. And, and you know, I, it's I think... It's a good dream. Yeah, I hold that dream, yeah. and I always will. And, you know, it's it's wonderful and inspiring to meet someone like you who's willing to take a stand for something good, something right, you know, that, that I think we need to evolve and we need to come to that point. The point that you it, it took you to reach this point uh, because of the fears that you had. But, yeah. you know, I mean, hopefully we can get to that point where people don't have to go through those fears, like you said, that 14-year-old. You know, it's going to take you, and it's going to take me, and it's going to take us, our collectively addressing. You know, when I was a kid in church, I was told that there was something wrong with me. And it's one of the reasons why I've joined the Board of Faith in America which is a nonprofit organization which combats faith-based bigotry in, uh, that especially does a lot of damage to young people. And, you know, in church, you're, you're, implored, you're encouraged by your community in church to try not to be an alcoholic. Of course, of course. Mm-hmm. Try not to be a junkie. 
of course. Try not to be a thief and try not to shoplift, of course. Because when, when we go through, we, we, as young people and older young people, we have crossroads in life where we get, we get to make decisions and sometimes we fail. We're sinners and we fail. Um, but when we tell our young people, try not to be gay, as if they have a choice, as if there's a point, a juncture at which they can decide that, that is where the damage starts, and that is why young people cut their arms, mm. and that's why they start to medicate, and that's why they, the worst thing that they can do is start to hate themselves. And um, I'm really proud as a, as a Christian to say I, that I have a strong re- relationship with God, and I'm gay, and they're not mutually exclusive. Mm. You're a role model for many people around the world, and you remain a role model. Um, Shelley Wright is our guest. This is the Voice of America. She not only has a new album out, she has a new book. The book is called Like Me. I imagine people can get it online. They can. Anywhere they buy music, they can find it. Now, how are your your peers responding, reacting? What's the response? I'm, I'm sure it's great, positive, overwhelming, lots of love. Um, I have heard from the, my artist friends that I thought I'd hear from. Mm-hmm. Um, I have heard from my good friend Trisha Yearwood, and and her husband Garth has been supportive. Mm-hmm. Um, but Trisha is my good friend, mm-hmm. um, so I, she, you know, she and I have emailed and talked, and she even came out and performed at my benefit show uh, last Tuesday in Nashville for mm-hmm. Reading, Writing, and Rhythm. Uh, which, by the way, we're ten years old, and we've raised over a million dollars for public school kids. I'm proud to say. I've heard from uh, Faith Hill. I've heard from uh, Mary Chapin Carpenter, mm-hmm. um, DC's very own mm-hmm. Mary Chapin Carpenter, um, and I've heard from the community outside of country music, mm-hmm. um, people like Melissa Etheridge and Rosie O'Donnell and Ellen DeGeneres, people who have actually been through what I'm going through, and that's been of great comfort to me, to have people who know what it's like to face your public and stand up and say, like it or not, this is who I am, um, and the the country music industry, not just artists, but the industry has been incredibly supportive. Um, The radio industry has been great. I'm not saying they're playing my records like crazy, but I'm not so sure. You know, it's not like I was Taylor Swift who came out, you know. Um, I'm I'm, I'm a different kind of artist now. I'm less of a commercial artist and more of an Americana AAA artist, Mm -hmm. I would guess, that that's what I would be called now. Um, But my, my friends in radio have reached out to me and and I have to tell you, I've had no fewer than 25 people in the industry come out to me and ask me to not tell. And I will hold their, I will keep their secret, of course, because I get it. I understand it mm-hmm. can be devastating to a career. But there are others uh, in the country music industry at large. I'm talking radio, promotion, marketing, mm-hmm. um, that uh, hold the same fears that I held for so long. And... Um, you know, I, the, thing, the thing with me is I told the gay pride audience, the Capital Pride audience yesterday, um, we, I was addressing Don't Ask, Don't Tell from the stage, which I guess I can, I can say whatever I want now. <laughs> but um, I needed to come out because I can't be fired from my job. And our uh, friends uh, in the military, guys and gals who are serving uh, in secret, uh, they can be fired. And I just... I just want to say how insanely um, ridiculous that we all know that policy is. And I just want to say that um, it's uh, because I can't be fired. You know, yeah, I, I, I know people can stop buying my records, and I'm sure some have. But, um, but others will. Others will. Mm-hmm. And um, I just want to say that my country music community, the ones I thought I would hear from, I have heard from. The ones I didn't think I'd hear from, no surprise, I haven't. Mm. Well, that's a shame, and you never know. Maybe you will. Maybe you will still hear. Because yeah. I know country music is a very close, tight-knit we family we uh, of musicians. And it's, yeah. it's different than pop musicians. And it's, it's, kind of, it's always been a different genre of music. Yeah. You know? It's a small town, Nashville. And, you know, it's, somebody said the other day, um, I think they were trying to get me to talk about my resentment towards Nashville. And I said, I have to stop you. I said, I... Yes, Nashville, the industry uh, and my hiding Mm -hmm. has caused me to simmer with anxiety. Yes, Mm -hmm. that's true. When you hide, like me, uh, for your entire career, it it does cause some anxiety. But people have to remember that town is also the town that made my dreams come true. Mm -hmm. I love that town. I moved to that town when I was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. I still, you know, that's where my primary residence is, although I live in New York most of the time now. 
I um I've lived in Nashville longer than I've lived anywhere, and I I still very much consider myself a part of the Nashville community. And um, the, if there are if there's progress to be made in Nashville, let let it begin. <laughs> 